Good afternoon. I think I'm standing between you and the and the part the fifth anniversary party. So <laughs> let's just make this real quick. This is one of the coolest stages I've ever been. I'm going to lay on that couch for that. Looks pretty cool. Um, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, innovation in government, open data, and, and what I think the potential is uh, uh, you know, in front of us. One of the scenarios I love to use is, is pondering uh, what is the most expensive purchase of most Americans' life. Sometimes it's healthcare related, but most of the time it's their home. It's their first home or their upgrade to their home. It's a huge decision that you have to make when starting your life, you know, becoming professional and living the American dream is, is going through and picking your first house. And you think about what, what's the data we provide for those people that make their most expensive purchase of their life? Well, we all know the multiple listing service. You can go and, and access the, the MLS online and get all this information about, uh, you know, what is the, where is the house physically? What street is it on? What county is it in? Uh, what's the roof composition? How many bathrooms are in the house? How much parking do you have? What's the, is it well water or, or city water? Those sort of things. Uh, but that's really not enough in a 21st century country. You know, the things I want to know when purchasing a house are things like, how close is it to an organic farm? Is it within 25 miles? Can I buy locally? Uh, can, I, can I get access to, to healthy options from a food desert standpoint? What's the air and water quality look like? You know, is it clean air where this house is? Is the, is the water quality good? What, what do we know about that? Um, what's the crime look like around this house? Has there been bad things happening in this house? Um, you want to know that, right? What's the weather look like? <laughs> is, it a, is it in a floodplain? Is it susceptible to... Uh, to uh, you know, horrific storms or things like that. Growing up in the Midwest, I certainly, you know, had a reality of, uh, of tornadoes all the time, and we, we hear that a lot these days. What's the quality of medical care near this house? What do people pay? How, how good is the medical care? Do people, do they live healthier lives when they live in these neighborhoods? What's the quality of education? How do the teachers rate? How do the test scores? What are, what's the graduation rate look like when I move into these? And probably the one of the most important ones to me, what are the broadband capabilities, <laughs> all right? Unfortunately for my wife, I care more about broadband than I care about bathrooms or roofs or even parking. Um, and you know, any of you out here would probably make a decision if you saw two houses that are relatively the same. One had DSL, one had fiber. I think I'd know which one all of you would pick. Uh, probably the same one I would. You know, and, and the list goes on and on and on on things we can do from the standpoint of society, providing Americans data about making the most expensive purchase of their life. You know, I, I mentioned a few of those, energy, social impact, uh, agriculture, public, secu you know, public security, weather, participatory government is the place where I'm moving maybe across the country and the continent like I did when I joined the administration have the ability to, for me to participate with my government and things like that. So those questions are, are out there. We can fundamentally change what is the most expensive purchase of most Americans' life by just doing a little bit of work inside government. But it's, it's hard, and we all say it's hard. And you know, what are those headwinds that are pushing us into, into saying, you know, let's, let's maybe just wait this out, sit on our hands, think about you know, not doing things differently than the way we've done before. Well, they're, you know, one of those things where we're championing our way out of an economic downturn, a pretty bad one. From the, the bubble bursting in the late 90s to 2008, we saw a bad you know, turn of events. And you know, we've, we've been doing amazing, as a country, we've been doing an amazing job to, to champion ourselves, you know, positive job growth month after month after month. All the indications look good, but it's still hard, and that's leading to the fiscal environment we're in now. You know, from a federal uh, government standpoint, it, you know, sequester, employees being furloughed, all of that is really hard. Talent drain based on that is, uh, is all driving a, a quite, quite a, a tough environment from that standpoint. Cybersecurity. This is one we unfortunately hear about all the time, and the threats are evolving and becoming more complex and more difficult, and do we have the talent to face this? Are we, are we allocating budget and resources properly to think about cybersecurity and, and driving that forward is a key one. We also have a, a culture, you know, broadly 
inside government that is, that is basically predicated on two things. One is a mentality that says, to do more, I must spend more. That's why we were growing federal IT prior to 2009 at 7% annually. And another one that says that I don't want to fail. I don't want to be that person that had that $100 million project scrapped after five years and have a really expensive three-ring binder on my shelf. You know, I don't want to do that. And, and because of that, you, you then overlay this, this notion and this culture that says, you know, my prescription for the future is the way I've always done things. You know, you, how many times have you met some innovative person in a government agency who is sitting in the basement with a red stapler on their desk because the, because the culture of the agency is keeping them down? They're, it's saying, you know, we don't do th that this way around here, and you, you, know, you, better, you better play along and, and drive this forward. So, so all of those things are, are, are driving us forward. And, you know, America generally has faced challenges all the time, and the great thing about our country is that when we're faced with some adversity, some disruption in our society, we champion our way out of it. You know, and, and typically, if you trace that back over the history of our, our country, it's been innovation that drives that forward. It's you know, from, from great wars uh, to economic downturns uh, to, to uh, you know, blips in the economy or things happening overseas or you know, the silver standard on currency, all these things drove different disruptions in, in our society. Natural events that happen drives disruption. And what makes America great and differentiates us really from the rest of the world is that when faced with those adversity, it's innovation that takes us out of those adversities. And, and uh, you know, the, the, my, my favorite statistic based, you know, based on this is, is over 50% of the Fortune 500 companies founded in our country's history were founded in the worst economic times in our history. You know, if you trace back the late 1800s and the long depression that started around 1890, um, IBM was founded in that, in that time frame. My alma mater of Microsoft, 1975, during economic downturn. You know, time after time, Procter & Gamble, you just go back in time and look at these major American companies were founded in some of the worst economic times. And, and that translates, if you trace it back, to two things. One was access to people. Now people evolve and they change and they grow and they learn, but the key there was people that knew technology. And it was often and you know, almost universally some new technology that was available to us that could drive that phenomenon forward, that gave us the ability to do things better, faster, and cheaper, and created that next Fortune 500 company. And so we stand at that, that inflection point now, you know, with the economy and championing our way out and the fiscal pressure we're under, the cyber pressure, all of these things are positive forcing functions to make us think differently and make us do things in government differently. And, and I'm, I'm encouraged by that because I think we can repeat the formula and, and, and champion our way again. I think it's centered around, you know, three things. One is focusing, maniacally focusing on innovation. How are we driving innovation both inside and outside government to change the way we do things, change the way we build things, and change the way we provide data for those homeowners out there and changing that scenario and so many others. It's about finding efficiency inside our, inside our government, living within our means, breaking that culture of to do more, I must spend more. We found, and luckily, you know, federal IT has grown up in such a way that there is savings to be had out there. And if you cull those savings, you can actually pour them back into, uh, back into innovation. You know, steal from the OPEX column to give to the CAPEX column. Just create, you know, rinse and repeat that formula across everything you do. And the last part is, is accountability. You know, this is, this is not only transparency and thinking about transparency relative to, you know, fighting corruption and fighting wrongdoing and things like that, putting the White House visitor log online. It's also thinking differently about the way we build programs, the way we do policy, the way we do grant making. So I'll talk about each of these things real, real quick. So innovation to grow the economy. Some key things we're doing in this space is, one, the digital government strategy. It's a, it's a year and a couple months old, and the, the premise of the digital government strategy launched in May 2012 uh, by the president, myself, and Todd Park, the chief technology officer, was to focus the government on some key deliverables for 12 months, you know, really culminating in, in the um, open data executive order and policy we issued about a month ago. And, and this the digital government strategy calls on government to do a few things. One is embrace mobile and think about mobile as the computing platform for the future. 
Today we treat mobile and on-premise computers differently, the way we manage them, the way we monitor them, the way we look at um, uh, you know, utilizing those inside the walls of government. That needs to change because we're not very far from that just being the computing model and the way we need to, to carry things forward. And so that's, that's key to us that we need to embrace mobile. We came with a lot of deliverables here on not only thinking about how we procure mobile inside the government. You may have noticed the, a few weeks ago we announced the, the family plan uh, for, for using government minutes inside, inside government where we start pooling minutes and getting what American families are able to utilize with these carriers across the scale of the U.S. government. Uh, we came up with security uh, baselines and security information on uh, you know, translating to carriers out there and phone manufacturers. Here's how we want the next generation phones uh, built for government use to really foster in the phenomenon. And we focused a lot of energy on customer service. How are we building app the next generation applications, websites, and other things so that uh, Americans who are utilizing government service can utilize that agnostic of the screen in which they are uh, accessing it? or agnostic of being wired versus wireless and, and getting all of that. And so, and so it was a key set of deliverables with the, the culmination, as I mentioned, really being the open data executive order and policy coupled with the Presidential Innovation Fellows, which is a program that allows private sector entrepreneurs and innovators to come into government for six to 12 month rotations and tackle some of these big challenges, working side by side with, with agencies of government to, uh, to do that. We're now starting to look at how can we do that in the reverse? How can we take government professionals in, in a non-conflicted way, rotate them out to the private sector to learn acumen, to learn different skills, to do things there, and then bring that back to government, create that virtuous cycle. And so all of that is happening today. On the efficiency and effectiveness, the, the live within our means, we must, we must uh, uh, you know, operate on a fixed or declining budget uh, in the space of technology. Um, we've got a lot going on in this space. I think this has been some of the best work coming out of, out of uh, you know, the White House and the, and the agencies working together to really drive this forward. I mean, luckily, maybe not luckily, but you know, coincidentally, uh, we grew up like everyone else, just at a, at a bigger scale where you know, it was unthinkable to run more than one workload on a server and a data center galore. You just you know, had a new need, just fire up a data center and build that inside your building or in some other facility, things like that. So we, we grew up with a lot of, you know, which the private sector too, did too, bad behavior that scaled out, lots of duplication, lots of this out there. And so that's all waiting for us to call to pull back, to understand how do, we, how do we maniacally go and reduce this duplication to drive those savings. You know, I walk into an agency of government, if they're, if they're running more than one email system, I really raise my eyebrows. You know, it's unthinkable in the private sector for any of you in the private sector companies to run more than one. Um, you know, that's kind of, it's not necessarily commodity, but it's, it's, you know, generic enough that we can build our requirements and flexible enough we can build requirements across a large department to run one. And we're seeing great motions there. You know, USDA moved from 21 email systems to one cloud-based one, massive savings. You know, they moved from uh, you know, nearly 1,000 mobile contracts to, to just a couple blanket purchase contracts. Not only did that save massive amounts of money and get them buying power across that footprint, it also doesn't take 1,000 contracting officers to actually manage those things. You can actually have one do that and, and do it for the whole department. So powerful stuff. And you know, there, are, there are billions of dollars waiting for us. Uh, I ran a process called Portfolio Stat, kicked off in 2012, that looked left to right across to these departments to understand what were we doing to, to really find these savings. Um, and we, we identified in that first year $2.5 billion of real line item things we were gonna go do across the 100 opportunities to, to migrate in agencies month after month are now reporting in their, their targets against that 2.5. I think that's the tip of the iceberg on where we're actually gonna go with this stuff. I think we have a massive you know, amount of capital infusion waiting for us to go innovate with if we do it right and we think about the, the moving parts. In some cases, it's even just paperwork exercise where agencies just have to renegotiate a contract, not even change the devices, change anything out. It's just literally run some paperwork and, and you, can, you can get savings. And so there's an opportunity there. The funny thing about this one too is it actually ends up helping the vendor community because vendors have a lot of you know, operational expense in managing the relationships at a thousand levels of mobile contracts versus one or two as well. So you can, you can really make this a win-win. 
the, the key initiative around you know, the, that portfolio stat at, acts as a feeder to is the Federal Strategic Sourcing Initiative and our Strategic Sourcing Leadership Council. So we've, we've assembled a group of Avengers inside government who are, represent a huge percentage of our, our buy uh, that are now working maniacally on looking at how do, we, how do we do a few things. One is start to look at strategic sourcing. How do we combine these contracts to drive uh, you know, better throughput on those? And then how do we go and think about you know, setting, uh, you know, price, prices paid and understanding that across government. Because a lot of times the mystery here is just you don't know what things should cost. You don't know what, what uh, you know, an email should cost per user per month or a mobile device. You know, when we go into cities like Atlanta, you will see massive, you know, same, same service, uh, you know, a BlackBerry unlimited voice, unlimited text, unlimited data you know, having massive swings in cost to the order of 50 or $60 of difference per month between that same service for five different agencies in the same city. And so we, there's a lot of opportunity there uh, on the mobile side. And, and we think another area of opportunity is in grants reform. Looking at the way we actually dole out uh, grants from the US government, how do we build efficiency into that? Because a lot of federal dollars are actually spent on the grant side and, and uh, to the recipients downstream, be the state and local governments or innovative companies using grants to do science and research and other things. We wanna, we wanna uh, you know, really pull that forward. And the last section is transparency, accountability, and a participatory government, I think is a key element to what we need to, we, we're driving. Um, you know, with the open data policy and executive order, we, uh, in a coinciding way, launch project open data which is uh, something I've mandated as, as we come out with policy, I want to see tools and resources and other things to make it easy for, for people to, uh, to implement those policy. Policy launches should not be idea launches, they should be product launches. And Project Open Data is a place where agencies and the public can now go and contribute to our ability to, to open up data in a much more rapid fashion. So you have a comma separated value database or a common database format or an Excel file or things like that. We have tools up there, you just point at it, click, and it will create a, an API, a machine readable API set out of this data. And so there are things like that to just make it very easy to implement the guidelines we put forward in our open data work to streamline that. We encourage the private sector innovators out there to, to jump on the bandwagon, to use Project Open Data, add to the tool sets, and help us evolve it uh, from that side. The other thing I'm really excited about uh, in, this, in this year is, is one of the things I did on the federal IT side was, uh, was stood up a, um, uh, a data team to really understand, you know, in a very modest way, what, are, what data do we have around how we use federal IT, what should that mailbox cost? What are agencies, how do agencies compare to each other on different cost structures and things? And it led to incredible results for a very modest investment from, from appropriations and, and working through OMB of about $5 million. We've had over $500 million in return on that investment of savings that have been driven by really getting analytical data to bear on this. And what I soon discovered is, hey, there's potential here well beyond federal IT, that we can actually stretch this into understanding in a rigorous data-driven scientific way, how are we managing policy, how are we managing programs, how are we managing grants that we give out to really understand what works. Um, and so the evidence base in the tw President's 2014 budget that we just presented to Congress, there is a, again, a little modest line item that, that uh, builds an operational capacity to do evidence-based work within the US government. And this basically means that we will stand up a very small team to go out and look at how do we bring scientific rigor, testing methodologies, and other things like, like we do in the private sector all the time, and A-B tests and other things, to bear on government programs. And then how do we bring behavioral insights as an overlay to that? You know, the UK government's done some innovation in behavioral oversights. They had a, a test where they, uh, their, te their Office of Tax Delinquency ran, a, ran an experiment that basically said we have these people that aren't paying their taxes. Let's, uh, let's split them in a, let's take a test group and let's split them into four uh, and then decide, okay, the first group is gonna get a letter that says, uh, that says they, uh, it's the normal letter they send out every year. The next group is gonna get that same letter, but in plain language version of it. So somebody went and cleaned it up, made it friendly or easier to understand. The third group wasn't getting a letter at all. They were just gonna do nothing with them and see what happened. And then the fourth group was gonna get a, the same letter, but with some behavioral insights 
in it, which uh, they added a line that literally said, nine out of 10 of your neighbors have paid their taxes, why haven't you? And that one line, that one letter and that group yielded uh, about 15 to 20% higher returns on their tax returns. So simple, low cost intervention using behavioral insights can have massive impact on our federal government. You think about improper payments, you think about the work we do in grant making and policy and everything else, um, you know, using this evidence, gathering evidence, and more importantly, when we build programs, when we build software, when we build other things, doing that in a way that brings in behavioral insights and evidence from the outset. And we take a little bit of the spend and we say, wow, if we had some, some data come feeding off this that we could learn from, we can actually get a lot smarter and spend our money a lot better. And so this is something that uh, you know, Congress is getting excited about, the university community and researchers are very excited about, and we've got a lot of momentum here to carry this forward into 2014. Um, uh, a couple other deliverables we've, we've put out recently, if you didn't see this news, uh, it's the first time this has ever existed about, uh, I think it was last week we shipped the program list for government. So this is a comprehensive list. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good first effort at a list of all programs that the federal government runs. Um, so you can find that list up on uh, performance.gov. And then I think a lot of you know about usaspending.gov, another key important area where transparency and accountability is available at the, both the, the grantee level on who we give money to in government, but also the, uh, the subcontractor level and, and all that. So it's, it's a very good way of, of, of tracking what's going on inside your government. All these things, you know, this motion of, of let's go find the savings together, let's go innovate together and think about that. And then let's make sure we put in performance metrics. We have a culture of data around this uh, and, we, and we hold ourselves accountable to the work that we do is, is all key, I think, to the, to the 21st century government. The one we stand at that edge uh, and look forward to, to fostering together. You know, the, what, what I hope we see in the future by doing it this way is that, you know, we stop building these giant monolithic proprietary systems that we start building, you know, modular, agile, uh, interoperable, based on open machine readable data systems that are reusable and, and, and extensible and future ready in a way that we can all stand together, marking 2013 as the year that that all ended and that we change the course of, of government going forward. So I will call on all of you as I conclude to, you know, help us seize on this opportunity. If you're in the private sector, change the way you do business with government. You know, take what you do and the way you build solutions inside your own businesses and bring that to, bring that to the federal government because we need, our time is now, we need this. Uh, and if you're inside government, you know, take a different approach. Go find that innovator down in the basement. Give them permission to innovate. Work hard. If you, if you don't get permission inside your organization, come find me. Email me and tell me, tell me about it and I, I, will, I will go force that permission. Uh, you've got uh, the president uh, caring a lot about this. I care a lot about this. Todd Park, the entire administration, you know, knows deep in our hearts, as all of you do, that innovation is what makes America great. Thank you.